Please turn with me in the Word of God to Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. This morning we will be looking at the healing of the centurion's servant from Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible Word. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thank Thanks be to you, God. God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you today for this particular portion of your word and this story of this wonderful miracle, but uh, an even more uh, wonderful faith. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to see the things that you would have for us and that uh, you would be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. So, last week we looked at the healing before and after this. Today we are looking at the healing of the centurion's servant, which is paralleled in Luke chapter 7. The healing right before this uh, was the healing of the uh, leper, which we remember. And then after this is the healings of Peter's uh, mother-in-law, as well as uh, the healing of the demoniacs and others. So we are still in the early parts of Jesus' ministry and as we think about the these healings and we think about these miracles we need to remember that miracles first of all are meant to authenticate the messenger so whenever we see these the first thing we should think of is that jesus is being authenticated as <coughs> one who is speaking for god and eventually they really begin to authenticate him as the Son of God, and God incarnate. This is also following the section on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus has done much teaching. There's also a couple other odd things about this particular account of the healing. It's a bit of an unusual request for a couple reasons. First, it is a request where someone else is coming on behalf of the person who needs to be healed. And even more unusual is the source of the request. It's a Roman centurion. Now, general rule was that the Jews did not like the Romans. The Romans were the occupiers. They didn't like them. Now, we're going to find out that they like this particular centurion. But for a Gentile to be coming to Jesus for the healing of his servant, that's, that's also certainly odd. Another feature about this passage uh, that, uh, that, I think, that I noticed was that the actual healing is almost secondary to the point of the passage. The healing is mentioned almost in a very matter-of-fact way at the end. No big production about it, nothing. It just, go, he's healed. 
And we read that he was healed the same hour. But the attention is focused not on the person being healed, but on the person asking for the healing. And we should do the same in our seeking to understand this passage. So we're going to look at this under a few headings here. The first is the servant situation. The second is speak a word. The third is sitting down. And the fourth is sons of the kingdom. So servant situation, speak a word, sitting down, and sons of the kingdom. So let's begin by reviewing the servant situation. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now, when we look at the account in Luke, we notice a few differences. It says in Luke chapter 7, Verse 3, that when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built a synagogue. Matthew says that the centurion came to him. Is this a problem? Well, not really. See, it would have been, it's Matthew's kind of style, apparently, to kind of truncate things a little bit. And this would have been an acceptable way of telling the story. Not considered to be lying, not considered to be altering the story, but a, a normal way of, of telling the story. And in fact, if you understand what is going on, these elders of the Jews are in fact speaking for the centurion. That is what they are doing. They're coming on his behalf, speaking for him. <clears throat> so we must not be too concerned over these minor uh, changes in detail. We also have to remember that Matthew's intention and Luke's intention in telling this story are slightly different. They're preaching or writing to slightly different audiences. Matthew is <clears throat> writing to a Jewish audience, whereas Luke is not. But there's some other things that we notice about this account as we go on. In Matthew's account, we just read that the centurion says that his servant is in need of healing. But in Luke's account, the elders of the Jews come and they plead the goodness of this Roman centurion. Maybe, maybe they're afraid that Jesus, expecting, by the way, that if Jesus is the Messiah, if those things <clears throat> are starting to ro roll around in their head, they may think Jesus is not going to do anything for a Roman centurion, and especially a Roman centurion servant. So they plead the goodness of the servant, or of the, of the centurion. He's deserving. He loves the Jews. He built us a synagogue. As if they need to convince <clears throat> Jesus to do this healing. And to some degree, their expectations would be normal. The expectations of the centurion are that Jesus will heal this servant, or at least his, maybe I should say, his hope. I don't know if he's expecting it, but his hope is that the centurions, that his servant will be healed. So as we move on in this account, we see that this centurion doesn't want Jesus to come to his home. And Ted, instead, he says, you can just say a word. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now we know from, G from Luke's account that when the elders come to him, <clears throat> Jesus says, I will go. And Jesus went with them. And Jesus is on the way to the house. 
when the rest of this conversation begins to take place. And it takes place through some of the centurion's friends who come out and say, Lord, do not trouble you, or do not trouble yourself. So it says, they look back in Matthew, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now, I want you to, to just wrestle with that for a moment and understand what I, I think is the significance of what is being said there. First of all, the centurion probably understood that it would at least be bad protocol for a Jew to go into a Gentile's home. That's a no-no. You don't do it. And so perhaps the centurion is thinking, no, 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 I don't need you to come. A word is enough. Perhaps, as I think, there's also a tremendous humility and respect. After all, based on what Jesus is going to say about him, I think the centurion is incredibly humble. He humbles himself before Jesus, I guess in this case more metaphorically than literally, because they won't see one another in the account. But he understands Jesus' authority as well. And understands, I think, that Jesus' authority is much greater than any authority he as a centurion has. And so if he as a centurion has a great deal of authority, how much more must this man have? For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I said to this one, go. And he goes. To another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. Jesus, or the, the centurion understands that, that Jesus is able to just say something. That he has authority over, can I say, the health of people. He has authority over the human body, over disease. That he can just make it well, that he can just cast it away and it goes. doesn't seem to be something that maybe other people are catching on to, but it seems like the centurion is catching on to things with Jesus before some other people are. And that's why Jesus says what he says about the centurion. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, not to the centurion, mind you, not to the centurion's friends, but all the other people who are apparently walking along with Jesus and obviously in the hearing of the centurion's friends. He tells them, as I've titled this section, Sitting Down, Assuredly, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you, many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. When we compare Matthew and Luke, this is one of those cases where Luke gives us a little bit more information about what was said because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. So he is really saying, laying an emphasis on what Jesus is trying to tell them saying that many will come from the east and the west. But he says, first of all, that this centurion has great faith. I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. I, we don't feel the weight of that, just reading it on the page. But this was, this was a slap in the face to the Israelites, for Jesus to say that he has greater faith than everyone else he's found. Wow. What is this faith? It's certainly an unbridled trust in the power of Jesus 
He understands his authority. He understands his ability to heal. And he's probably at least heard of, as it says, he heard of Jesus. He probably heard of his teachings at the Sermon on the Mount. Perhaps he heard of the healing of the leper. Or other healings that may have taken place that we don't even know about. So he certainly understands that I can trust this man. I can have faith that this man is able to do what I am asking. Is it saving faith? Is it saving faith? I, I think at this point it would be very hard to say that. That this is saving faith for the centurion. Certainly, the centurion doesn't have all the information about Jesus that was yet to come. He doesn't have enough information for it to be saving faith. He probably has heard a call to repent some way through all of this. But yet, uh, if I had to venture a guess, this man we will probably find walking down the streets of gold. Because I cannot imagine Jesus commending his faith to this level and this man not, at least later, coming to a fully orbed faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But he also says, I say to you, Many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This, this is eye-opening news to the Jews, this early in Jesus' ministry, warning them in a sense, I think, understanding that they're going to not embrace him as Savior by and large, they're not going to recognize him as Messiah. So he's chastising them in a sense, even for their future rejection of him. But he's more letting them know there's going to be Gentiles in the kingdom of heaven. And if they had been attentive Jews to the word of God, they would have known this already. You know, the passage we read earlier talked about the nations. There are plenty of passages in the Old Testament that talk about the Gentiles coming in, the nations coming in. Go the whole way back to Genesis with, with Abraham being a blessing to the nations. The, the Jews should have been aware of this. And yet, because of their mistaken expectations of the Messiah, expecting him to come and overthrow the Romans, they they weren't looking for it. And so Jesus is pretty clear from the east and from the west. He's not talking about the east side of Israel and the west side of Israel, or the east side of Jerusalem and the west side of Jerusalem. He's talking about when you say east and west, you're talking about other peoples. Jesus says, they are going to come and they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, but Jesus cannot be more pointed at this point to refer to the forefathers, to, the, to refer to the patriarchs of Israel. I mean, say that the Gentiles are going to be sitting down at a table with them. That's a, that's a familiar Kind of thing. We know later on that we'll be told by the Apostle Paul that those who have faith are by faith sons of Abraham. Another thing about this that we should notice is the difference between what Jesus commends about the centurion and what the Jews commend about the centurion. What did the Jews say about him? The Jews said, he's a good man. 
He loves our people. He built a synagogue. I mean, this, this is this. This is the same thing as, as somebody coming in and saying, oh, he loves the church. He's built a church. This guy's great. You re he really deserves to have this done for him. Somewhat of a natural reaction for them to do, I guess. But what does Jesus commend? Jesus doesn't say a word about the synagogue. Doesn't say a word about his love for the Jews. It may even be possible that this man is what they call a God-fearer. I have a feeling he'd probably been hanging around the synagogue a little bit. To have heard about Jesus. Jesus commends his faith. Not his goodness. Not his accomplishments. Not his achievements. But his faith. That's a reminder to us. That's a reminder to us as we pray. It's a reminder to us in our life that there's nothing about us that makes us worthy of being healed by Jesus. And if you remember last week, you were here last week, we talked about the fact that the physical healings are connected to the spiritual healings that Jesus really brings there. They're a sign and a marker that Jesus is able to heal our spiritual condition. He is able to take us from being spiritually dead to alive. So we don't deserve it. Not one bit. Nothing we can do. Just the same way that the centurion didn't deserve his servant to be healed. The servant didn't do anything worthy. The, the centurion, great guy, didn't do anything to deserve it. But his faith, his faith was another story. Jesus goes on to talk about the sons of the kingdom. Verse 12. The sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Sounds pretty bad. Anytime weeping and gnashing of teeth is mentioned, it is in reference to judgment. It is a description of the tortures of Hell, outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. In many ways, we are seeing what Jesus will later teach about in the wedding parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. The first invited refused the invitation. Later on, the, the one who is holding this, this wedding, he goes out and, and just invites the people of the highways and the byways, the good and the bad, to come in. Isn't that what Jesus is telling them now? He's saying that you, the sons of the kingdom, you, you, you're going to reject life in the kingdom. Ironically, he calls them the sons of the kingdom bit of irony because they won't be part of the kingdom. They think they're sons of the kingdom. But they will not be. They will be cast out and they will pay for their own sin. Jesus finally concludes after all of this saying to the centurion, go your own way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his hurt the servant was healed that same hour. See what I said about the healing almost being secondary in this passage? It's 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 not quite an afterthought, but it's it's not the climax of the story. The, the, the high point of the story is 
the commendation of the centurion's faith and the lack of commendation for the people of Israel. It's a sad parable, or not parable, a sad account in that sense. Jesus is warning them early on in his ministry, and they're still not going to get it. They're still not going to get it. So there's some things we should think about as a result of this passage. I mean, the first is very simple. Do we trust Jesus? Do we trust Jesus? Now, I'm not just talking about trusting Jesus in saving faith. I hope that would be universal in our room here. I make no assumptions, but do we trust Jesus for saving faith? And do we trust Jesus in the contours and the twists and the turns of our lives? Do we trust Jesus when we are on our knees in prayer? We could easily flip that and say, do we trust <coughs> God? Do we come in our own authority, our own power, pleading our own case and saying, look at us. Look at what we've done for you, Lord. Look at how much we've suffered for you, Lord. Look at this. Look at that. Or do we come before him? Because in one sense, I mean, this is a prayer. He's going and he's asking Jesus for something. What is a large portion of our prayers? It is going before the throne of grace and asking God for something. Do we... Do we have our full trust in Jesus, recognizing that we must be humble as we approach the throne of grace? Yes, we are to approach the throne of grace with confidence to ask for our needs. But that doesn't mean that we're supposed to march in there and we're not supposed to plead our goodness, our confidence in approaching the throne of grace comes with the fact that the one who died for us is our great high priest and he grants us access. So we shouldn't never come and say, God, but I've done this. God, but I've done that. That's wrong. It's wrong. We need to come to him in humility and in trust. First, obviously, trust in him for salvation. Tying into this, going back to the words of the centurion about not coming, about Jesus not coming under his roof, we need to realize that we don't deserve to be in his presence. We don't deserve it. I mean, we really should be coming. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to come into your presence, but I am grateful, Lord, that through Jesus Christ, I am granted the right to be in your presence. It is by grace that we are able to be in the presence of God. It is by mercy that we are able to be in the presence of God. It is by grace and mercy that we have fellowship with Jesus Christ and Christ dwells within us through his spirit. It is all of grace. None, nothing of merit. So in one sense, this passage serves as a reminder of the power of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus, the, the authority of Jesus. 
and reminds us that we're none of those things. That we are poor and needy people who, first of all, for our salvation, come and we plead nothing. We have no case to make. We are those who come before the judge and say, You're right. I did it. Have mercy. Where are those who are coming and asking for help, saying, I don't deserve it. I've done nothing that deserves it. But I need your grace and your mercy anyway. That's who we are. That is who we are. And that is how we ought to live. As those reminded that we are in constant need of the grace of God in our lives, in our salvation, in our prayers. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who makes us worthy to come before the throne of grace. We, we thank you for the faith of this centurion, who serves as an example to us. We thank you that we are permitted, invited, welcomed to the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What a glorious day that will be. Lord, help us to live with hopeful humility. Lord, that we are able to realize who we are, but also that we serve a wonderful master in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreformed.com, or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out, and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.